But where's the lens? Right here. You're not pointing to anything. Yet. The little mm -hmm. brown thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You're alive. Um, you need to hook the phone into. We are. Great. Can you go ahead? Start? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kate Mulgrew, and I have just written a book, my second book, which is called How to Forget. And uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to read you an excerpt. Looking down. I remembered a snowbound evening two years earlier when Dad, Mother, and I had gathered around a miniature bonfire just yards from the front door. Javier, Lucy's husband, had shoveled until he carved an ideal spot for us, a perfect circle wherein he had placed a small but beautifully mounted bonfire. Three chairs had been arranged around the fire, each covered with a heavy blanket, and Lucy had provided a picnic consisting of cheese and crackers, ham sandwiches, and a bottle of Jameson. We gathered around the fire as I filled our glasses with whiskey. Both of my parents were relaxed, and this state, I knew, could provoke mischief in both of them. A winter picnic appealed to their sense of whimsy, their love of the unexpected. I watched them sitting side by side in the glow of the fire, and it was as if they'd made the mutual decision to put all of their troubles aside and submit completely to the moment. My mother, wrapped in her checked blanket, legs crossed, was full of a girlish confidence I had forgotten she once possessed utterly. She reveled in the moonlight, the fire, the heat of the whiskey. She loved the novelty of it, as well as the freedom. We were having an adventure, and she was thoroughly immersed in it. She was the central character in this vignette, and like the best actresses, moved to dispel that notion at every turn. She proffered her glass for more whiskey. She winked at me as I poured. She reached out and half batted, half stroked my father's cheek. She gazed at the moon. A part of her knew it was unlikely that she would experience such a night again, and so she allowed herself to be ravished by it. Next to her in his green down jacket, my father sat upright in his chair, a blanket draped over his knees. Raising his glass, he blew a kiss to the moon with his free hand and said, Just beautiful. In the light of the bonfire, I saw deep pleasure in his, in his eyes, an inward look that told me this was enough. His wife at his side, the whiskey warming them both, his daughter across the way, looking on. He talked of the things that gave him satisfaction, and my mother, in her silence, concurred. They relished the cold night, the sting of the whiskey in their throats, the broad and exquisite vista above them. They would not talk then or ever of affliction. It did not suit them. It did not become them. It was not their way. Theirs was the way of a cold night lit by an Iowa moon of laughter and of irreverence. They shared a profound unwillingness to let go of the moment. And so we sat for hours in the chill and the quiet of that moonlit night until the whiskey ran dry and the fire burned to embers, whereupon we all rose to our feet in unison, proclaimed it a damn good night, and looking upward once again, shook our heads in amazement. I want to thank you for everything you've done for this family. How is it that words so longed for can hit and miss with equal acuity? Perhaps this was my father's secret weapon to withdraw at exactly the moment of greatest accord, a skill he had deployed with such cleverness over the years that I failed until now to recognize that he had been doing it all along. Thank you. And now I'd love to take your questions, if you have any. They're going to be rolling in here in a second. Uh, mm -hmm. First, I want to let you know, too, that people are watching from all over. All over the world. Italy. I would, 
I would list every place, but it would sound like roll call at the UN. Great. So, <laughs> not going to do that. Uh, so I guess the first question is just how is the recording going? I love this process. And recording this book in particular is gratifying because it's about my parents. I'm alone in the booth with a microphone and uh, headphones, and I'm allowed to let my spirit wander where it will. And this gives me great, great emotional freedom. So it's hugely gratifying. Um, what were the difficulties in, in writing the book? I think the difficulties always in writing uh, have to do with honesty, central, emotional honesty. Um, sometimes the inclination is to entertain, and that is not what is uh, going to be compelling. What is going to be compelling is the truth uh, about these relationships that I had with my parents and that they had with each other, about the relationships I had with all of my siblings, and then ultimately my relationships with their respective illnesses, which were cancer and Alzheimer's disease. So trying to excavate towards the central and most crucial theme of honesty, I'd say. Uh, we have a yeah, we have a question from Claudia. Uh, Claudia wants to know how long it has taken to record the book so far. I think this is my fourth day in recording. I'm fairly fast, and I probably would have been faster had it been another person's book. But because it's my own, I'm taking my time. But we'll finish today, so four days in total. And she'd also like to know what the hardest chapter to write was. I'm in it right now, Claudia. Um, uh, it's about how my mother is dying. I've already put my father to rest, and... And now my mother, who has become fossilized in her bed by this horrendous disease, <clears throat> is about to say goodbye. And uh, I find that I'm, I'm emotionalizing it, and it's physicalizing in my throat, and that um, that's okay. It's okay. Gemma would like to know how this has differed from Born With Teeth, this experience with this book. That's a very good question, Gemma. And... Uh, how this has differed from writing Born With Teeth, <clears throat> and a, an important one for, for me to to think about, to consider, and to answer, because I, I consider them light years from each other. They're very different books, uh, maybe even stylistically, although it's clearly my voice and my prose. I have, I determined before I began this book to go to a different level. Born with Teeth was more linear, certainly, more uh, uh, of an explanation of a life. This is the, the, the reliving of something that shaped and defined the most important people in my life. <clears throat> Let's see. We have another question. Um, are you still a spokesperson for the Alzheimer's Association? Kat would like to know. That's good, Kat. Am I still a spokesperson for the Na Alzheimer's uh, organization? Upon occasion, um, they ask me to do things. I, m most of my involvement is with the University of Minnesota Hospital, wherein lurks uh, a great scientist by the name of Dr. Karen Ash, uh, an absolutely extraordinary neuroscientist and a pioneer in the field of Alzheimer's. So I'm a spokesperson for the University of Minnesota for her particular uh, project, and for the Grossman Center, which is where I speak when I go there. Uh, Shell would like to know what was the driving factor in writing this book? Shell would like to know what is the driving factor in writing How to Forget. Uh, another great question. And so why do I pause? Because it probably lives very deep. Do you know? The driving question was, who am I? because of what they were to one another. It was it, crucial to me that I understand, come to an understanding of my parents' love for one another, the difficulties that they managed to overcome and those that they did not. Uh, most essentially, the griefs that they shared and what, what that did to them in their later years. So the question was, how deep and how true can I go into this, into the past of my parents? 
So Mark would like to know if you have thought about writing other genres, including fiction. Mark, that's a very nice question. You want to know whether I, I'm interested in doing uh, fiction. I'm just going to shortcut that by answering yes. And I'm hoping <laughs> that my next book will be a novel. Yay. I already have the title percolating in my brain. And I already have the cast of characters. But I'm just not sure whether there'll be a murder or not. Ooh. Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Barry wanted to know, where do you go to write? Barry, excellent question. Where do I go to write? Well, I've been so lucky because I go to Ireland. Uh, a wonderful woman has given me her house for the past three years in Galway on the shore of Loch Corrib. So I lived in a beautiful manor house in the dense, quiet, uh, typical of, of only the west of Ireland with that uncannily beautiful light, uh, with the swans in the lake in front of me, and the mist, and the fairies. And I would put my computer on my desk and write from nine to four, when it became so profoundly dark that I was shaken to the core of my being. It's a good way to write. Um, Millie wants to know what you would say to your younger followers about their aspirations and following what they want to do. Millie, I'm going to assume you're very young and you're asking uh, what I would say to you uh, about your aspirations, about what you want to do and how you want to do it. And that's very simple, Millie. Uh, that doesn't change from generation to generation. It's the same. Uh, it is the same directive and that is passion followed closely by discipline. So find what you love, what's the oldest, the most hackneyed saying in the world, and the rest will follow. I think that's Joseph Campbell, or was it Robert Bly? <clears throat> find what you love. And if you think you have found what you love, find the discipline to maintain it, and then the rest will come. But it's important to be passionate about something before you die. Let's see, Anna would like to know, I think this is a very good question, how has writing this book changed you and has it changed your view of yourself? Anna, you want to know how this book has changed me and if it's changed my view of myself. The answer to those questions is yes. Uh, uh, to the last question is yes. It's changed me. How? I would say when you write something like this, that is so stripped away and so even occasionally harsh, so difficult then to sleep with it, walk with it and be with it. You find out whether or not you're worth your salt. And so it, it stirs up a longing to be as perfectly honest with oneself as is possible. So that's what it's done to me. I've decided no more nonsense, no more nonsense. If I can be true and honest about what I have to now face and what's left of my life, that is what I wish to be. Several people <coughs> have asked <laughs> what your siblings have thought about you writing about your family and if you had any reservations. Uh, that's a lovely question to ask about how my siblings feel about this book. It's divided. Uh, I was once one of eight. Two of my sisters died, so there are six of us survivors. Um, I've given the book to all of my siblings, and the remarks have been um, from my brother Tom, very positive, uh, from my sister Jenny, really positive, and I, I value her opinion because she's quite a bibliophile, from my brother Joe, negative, uh, and that's understandable. He's featured in part one. He had a very close relationship with my father, and I write in depth and at length about it, and I don't think that he's pleased, but he's also a deeply private person. And uh, in my conversations with my mentor, Anne Roythe, about this very possibility, she said to me, it's inevitable. It's simply the risk a writer must take. Uh, the others have not weighed in yet. Sam likes it, I think, uh, but Laura I have not heard from. So I think it's going to be divided, and that's the nature of walking the plank, isn't it? Uh, Ryan has a very good question. 
Um, he says hello from the Yukon, so he's very cold. <laughs> and he would like to know um, when, how did you know the book was finished and what was it like to walk away? Brian, is it? Ryan. Ryan, you're in the Yukon, freezing to death, Amy tells me. Um, and yet able to form this perfectly. Uh, lovely question. So I'm guessing you're inside a cave, aren't you? All bundled up with a little fire, reading. Um, how do you know you know? You know, it's like love. You know when it starts, you know when it ends. Um, I had taken her to her death, my mother. I had certainly in part one, I take my father. And she had died. And then you can only go so far after that, I think. And one day I looked out and the swans had had their signets and it just came to me. I will end with the funeral mass and that's the way it will be. And it was right. And then it's unequivocal. No question of never, you never go back, I think, on the end. So we have a couple good ones. Um, Ruthie would like to know how you think your parents would react to the telling of their story. Ruthie, tough question. How do, would my, how do I think my parents would react to this? Not favorably is my um, gut reaction. Very private people. My father, certainly. My mother would probably give me notes on, on, what, on my a prose style. Um, I, I think they probably would, uh, if they had been, a, obviously it doesn't make any sense because I only wrote it because they, they are no longer alive. I wouldn't have dreamt of writing it while they were living. So I hope that answers it. Uh, Mary would like to know, what advice you would give to caregivers of aging parents? She has just begun to take care of her 92-year-old mother. What's her name? Mary. Mary. You're just beginning to take care of your mother who has uh, either Alzheimer's or dementia, as I understand it. And you're asking for what advice I would offer on how to take care. If you're going to do this alone, Mary, you are going to need all the fortification and confidence and rest and self-care that you can administer to yourself. Um, if, you, if at all possible, uh, solicit, uh, get your siblings to help you. Uh, and certainly I encourage, if you have any money saved, to get some outside help to come and, in and relieve you. It, because it is unrelenting. It is the hardest thing on the caregiver. So I do really urge you uh, to assist yourself in whatever way you can. Because even though she's 92 and probably very, very essentially easy to care for, uh, the details can be excruciating. And you will need some help. Good luck. Uh, Sophie would like to know, um, in exploring your relationship with your parents, has this affected how you look at your relationships with your own children? Sophie, what a smart question. You're probably a very, very, very astute person. Uh, in writing this book about my parents, how has this affected or, or informed my relationship with my own children? You know, it's curious. It's, if anything, encouraged me to not step away, but to give them as much space as they possibly need. I'm a, as you can probably gather, I'm, a, I'm pretty, pretty involved with them. And when I care to it can be quite passionate and sometimes I'm sure overwhelming so I think in the book uh, written about two parents who brought their daughter to independence at a very young age and let her go I think I began to, to really consider and examine and ruminate on what it means to allow your children to be independent and perhaps I've allowed some, some of that to blossom I hope so Let's see, we have a question. Well, Jess says hi from Iowa, so I thought you might want to. Jess, hi from <laughs> Iowa. Um, someone else, uh, Lori, asked about how privacy is a common theme in Irish families. And you talk a lot about being Irish and how that kind of informs your identity as a family. You yeah. wanted to talk a little bit about how you address that. Is it privacy, she was yes, saying? Yes, privacy in Irish families is a, it's a common theme. Privacy, what's her name? Lori. Lori. She's Pri also Irish. Yes. <laughs> Privacy in an Irish family is a not only common theme, but uh, uh, held to a high standard, this business of privacy. 
uh, and not to be um, and not to be in any way uh, besmirched. So it's difficult to write a book about uh, your parents without infiltrating <laughs> their privacy. But my parents are dead. So uh, I took it upon myself to go ahead and do this, knowing that at least part, a part of my family, a faction, and the generations coming will probably appreciate uh, at least elements of this story. But regarding the privacy, you know it's a funny thing because I'm with it too. I very much, very much guard my privacy. I, uh, I think we live in a time that does not value it, and I do. So I'm at odds with, although my social media director is sitting here and she's a genius, I'm at odds with social media, I'm at odds with this. Uh, but I, at the same time, understand it's, it's, it's great importance. I'm trying to, get, to catch the wave. Um, but in my heart, I'm, uh, I'm private. Um, Simon would like to know if you think that you're going to write about your acting career and inhabiting the roles that you've played over the years. Simon, you want to know if I'm going to write about my my life as an actress, my my experience as an actress. It's in this book. It's it, it was in Born with Teeth, and um, I will, I will. But it might be fictionalized. Do you know what I'm talking about, Simon? <laughs> but um, I think there's a lot of stuff I'd like to get into that I haven't. The rigors, uh, the surprises, the secrets, the darknesses of acting as well as the joys and the rewards, because uh, they're manifold. But uh, I think I might do it through a different character and really let her fly. So a lot of people are asking if you have any future TV plans for future TV roles. I think I can talk about this, can I? I don't know. I don't know either, but I'm, you know, this is what I mean about what I know and what I don't know. What, what can I say? You could what maybe say what to? network it's on. And no, I will say, I can say it. Yes, I'm doing a um, season three of Mr. Mercedes, which has um, been created by the incomparable David E. Kelly. And that's why I'm doing it, because the writing is out of this world. So I'm doing season three of that. And uh, after that, it remains to be seen. But I'm doing that right now, and it's heaven. Let's see. Um, Heather would like to know if you have any advice for uh, people who are maybe dealing with chronic conditions, like you've dealt, like you've seen your your uh, parents deal with people who themselves are dealing with them. How do I? What? I'm sorry. Repeated. I was thinking about the, what I just said. <laughs> I was thinking, um, Heather would like to. to know, Heather would like to know mm -hmm. if uh, you have any advice for those uh, people who are dealing with maybe chronic illnesses and how they've handled them, and if you have any advice from seeing people around you go oh, through Oh, Heather, who am I to give advice to people who are living with chronic illness or helping those others who are bearing this burden? My advice would be the advice that any person with an even remotely philosophical nature would give, which is try to be present to it, but try not to uh, be hyper-vigilant about it. Um, it is the kind of thing that can easily pull you into a depression. And you mustn't allow that. And the way not to allow that or to disallow that is to be present to it, to be calm, to be very patient, and to be as lighthearted as possible. You know, we all die. And uh, most of us will suffer in this life. So if you accept it as a shared experience or one that is just upon you, uh, accept it with equilibrium. This is the human condition, and we go together. Uh, let's see. Victoria would like to know who has inspired you besides your parents. We've got about three more minutes. So. Okay. Okay, three more minutes. Three more. Victoria, you want to know who has inspired me besides my parents? I'm constantly inspired by people. I'm always inspired by small children, especially small children who live in Manhattan. They're extremely knowledgeable and very, very brave. They walk across the street like they own the street. And you hear them talking to their nannies or to their mothers saying things like, well, I had an argument with that. And I just told the teacher, I have an argument with it. And I'm looking at the kid and the kid is five. And so, you know, articulate, so alive. I learn from little children and I learn from the very old who are full of the grace and wisdom, uh, the intricacies and the network of life. 
Um, I've learned from Stella Adler, my acting teacher. Uh, I've learned from my great friend, Claire Levine, who died two years ago. And I constantly learn from my deep and intimate friendships, as well as my relationships with my children for whom I would take the first bullet. Thank you. Let's see, we have two more questions uh -huh. um, from Carol, who you know, Carol LaPlante. Oh, Carol. Uh, yeah. She wanted to know if you've examined family dynamics, not only in your own family, but you see them in other families. Hi, Carol. It's so good to talk to you. You've been such a great part of my my life, certainly, since Star Trek. Um, you want to know about how this is what affected the... The family dynamics, how you observe family dynamics and, and think I do, about them. I do uh, observe family dynamics. Uh, I always have. I find them fascinating. They are fascinating. What else is there if not the family dynamic? Um, but it's a dangerous playground. Do you know? That sandbox can quickly turn into a minefield. And those little children so happily playing, otherwise known as your brothers and sisters, can turn into terrorists if you're not careful. On the other hand, it can be angelic. It's a kind of love so profound, so inexpressible. Uh, there's nothing like the love uh, uh, in a family. And I have that with my family. Uh, and so I, I, I observe it, I ardently observe it in other families, perhaps because I haven't seen it expressed as openly as it has been expressed in my family. I got lucky with my brothers and sisters. Very lucky with my parents. Thanks, Carol. So a lot of people are asking, um, and they they are saying, hello, Captain. So they wanted to know if there will be a return to the Star Trek universe to say goodbye to Janeway properly. This is a question that is asked and unanswered. Unanswered. So let's get it to the people in charge. I don't know if Janeway will ever return. I have not been asked to return. But I think it might be a, a wonderful thing to see um, Janeway as she ages. And certainly if I could, if she could be seen with Picard and Kirk at the same time, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it? What a way to go. That, that, that the preponderance of the legacy is ours. And I think that the, the, those who, of you who have followed us would love to see that brought to some kind of gracious closure. I certainly would. And maybe you can just have a, a note about uh, your book tour, how the dates are not quite set, but you look forward to seeing everybody. Amy. Um, I will have a book tour. Um, the pub date is May 21st, and I, I think that I open with the Today Show on that day, and that evening there will be a book event in New York. And I think then I go to, lo uh, to the West Coast, but the dates have not been confirmed. And until they are, um, it's sort of pointless to, to say anything. But they will soon be released. And when they are, please, I, I really encourage you. I would love to see you. Please come. So just, uh, you know, one final see everybody for pub date on May 21st and okay. have a little wrap up. All right. My book, How to Forget, is released on May 21st. Uh, this book has meant a lot to me. I hope that you will be there to share the release date with me and what follows shortly after the release date. And most importantly, I hope that you will read my book, because that is why I wrote it. Thank you very much.